Hello, my name is Bob Nielsen. I'm the Extension Corn Specialist at Purdue University. And today I want to visit with you about crop resilience to normal weather and what we can do to grow good corn more consistently. Now, the original title of this presentation was Crop Resilience to Climatic Variability, but the more I thought about it, I realized it's really the variability in weather that bothers us year to year in growing these crops and not so much the climate. And Mark Twain pretty much said the same thing. He said climate is what we expect and weather is what we get. So today's weather is certainly more variable than it was years ago. Um, we don't know in any given year to expect a severe drought or expect a severe rainy season like we had a couple years ago. Uh, we don't even know if every part of the state is going to experience the same weather. So the, because it's so much variable than it was years ago, this represents a huge challenge for us as we move ahead in growing crops over the next few decades. So because of this, I think we can actually redefine weather redefine normal weather, that is. And so I think today we can say that normal weather consists of an unpredictable number of unpredictable extreme weather events, each occurring unpredictably with unpredictable severity. And this again is our big challenge in growing crops, is how do we make these crops resilient? Uh, and so the question may not be whether we can grow good corn consistently, but rather the question might be, what can we do to grow corn, grow good corn more consistently? And I think it comes down to these three factors. It's about the need for resilient crop genetics. It's about the need to identify and mitigate other field specific yield limiting factors. And then to simply make good sound agronomic decisions. Now, the, the first factor of resilient crop genetics certainly uh, relies heavily on the seed companies themselves, and they've done a great job over the years of not only increasing yield potential, but increasing overall stress tolerance. But I'll mention later about the importance for us as users to do a good job of choosing hybrids that have good crop resilience. But I'm going to spend time with these three factors, especially the first two, uh, as we go through this presentation. So the one thing to keep in mind is that when we get extreme weather, whether it's single events or long uh, strung out weather patterns, the negative effects of extreme weather are often amplified by other yield limiting factors that may exist in the field. So for example, this is a picture of a field with clearly pretty uneven stand establishment. Um, in fact, you have to squint uh, to see the young corn plants in, in some areas of the field. And so this example is one where the field itself was naturally poorly drained. The, the tile were fairly old. They weren't working very well. And because of the poor soil drainage, there had been some soil compaction built up over the years. And so the presence of these two other yield limiting factors, along with excessive rainfall, simply made the effects of the excessive rainfall even more dramatic. Okay, so again, negative effects of weather can be amplified if there are other yield limiting factors in the field. So while we cannot control the weather, we can work with these other yield limiting factors. And so if we can identify and manage these other yield limiting factors in our fields, this will help us improve the overall resilience of the crops to the vagaries of mother nature that we can't predict. Now I said resilience, not stress proofing, because even though we can make the crops more resilient to stress, we really can't stress proof them, especially uh, stress proofing against say single time weather events like a straight line wind of 60 to 70 miles per hour laying the cornfield flat in a matter of minutes. Okay, so we're talking about resilience and the ability of a crop to simply better tolerate the effects of extreme weather. <coughs> so if we fail to identify and diagnose these other yield limiting factors in our fields, well then the crop itself will simply be further stressed and less resilient to the additional stress caused by extreme weather. Now, handling or trying to improve this crop resilience in and of itself is not rocket science. It simply requires hard work and some common sense and employing some good sound agronomic knowledge. And at the end of the day, 
the effects of stress on yield is a matter of how it affects one or more of the individual components that make up grain yield. So the plants per acre is pretty well set during the stand establishment period. Ears per plant is pretty static, meaning that most of our hybrids uh, will routinely put on one harvestable ear per plant. And so that is not often influenced as easily as these other components. But certainly kernel number per ear can be influenced by severe stress, and that uh, happens partly during the rapid growth phase when ear size determination is going on and also the success of pollination in the first couple of weeks following pollination. And then the remainder of the grain field period is about determining the weight of each kernel. And so these individual yield components develop throughout the entire growing season. They just don't all come together at one point in the season. It's a season-long process. And so because of that, achieving high yield consistently requires minimizing stress on the crop during the entire growing season. Crop resilience to stress relies heavily on what happens in the first 30 to 45 days during the stand establishment period. And the importance of establishing a healthy and vigorous stand of corn by the time the crop has reached V6 or roughly knee high is crucial to determining how well the crop will tolerate stress during the remainder of the season. And so if a crop can get to that knee high stage uh, in good shape, healthy, vigorous, uniformly healthy and vigorous, that's a crop that will simply tolerate stress much better than a crop that has struggled getting to that V6 growth stage. We know the factors that influence the success of stand establishment. And on this slide, I've highlighted in red those factors that we have some control over. And so this represents things we can do to minimize the stress during stand establishment and because of that, end up with a crop that is more resilient and a crop that can tolerate stress better later on. Now the success of stand establishment itself is not defined just by the plant population we count at V6. The success is also defined by the uniformity and health of those plants as I've already indicated and, and the, the health of that stand as it begins to enter the rapid growth period, which is the time period that ear size determination occurs. And the uniformity of health of those plants will influence the crop's ability to tolerate stress later on in the season. Once a uniformly healthy crop reaches pollination, well then the goal is to keep it uniformly healthy throughout the remainder of the grain fill period. And so this need for health and uniformity of, of growth is one of these, it's a factor that is just important throughout the entire season. So let me just talk about a few things or in a few yield limiting factors that, that we can work with to improve crop resilience. And I'll begin with this importance of improving soil drainage and, be, and with that then minimizing the risk of ponding and saturated soils or at least the duration of ponding and saturation. Improving soil drainage will minimize the risk of losing soil nitrate nitrogen through the process of denitrification. Better drainage will reduce the risk of creating soil compaction from field operations, and over time that will pay back benefits. And on conventional till fields uh, where it's so easy to create cloddy seed beds if we're working it a bit on the wet side, Improving soil drainage will simply improve the chances that field conditions are going to be fit for that kind of tillage. And then by improving soil drainage, it will simply uh, improve the timeliness of all the field operations, and that in and of itself will also have an effect on crop resilience. Crop resilience has an influence by the soil moisture that's available and erosion on the field, so certainly we can improve crop resilience by using techniques and using strategies that will conserve soil moisture and minimize soil erosion, especially on rolling topography. So it involves uh, strategies like moving to no-till or some form of reduced tillage, uh, using contour farming and perhaps even strip cropping if it's suitable for uh, the particular fields in your operation. It involves installing terraces and other water control structures to slow down the movement of that water or the landscape. And then also the use of fall or winter cover crops to have a living crop there during the off season to uh, not only maybe use excess water, 
but more importantly, simply to reduce the risk of soil erosion. And then those, the residue of those cover crops, obviously during the growing season, uh, will help conserve soil moisture and help uh, in those seasons where we move into an unusual dry spell. If you irrigate, we can improve crop resilience by simply doing a better job with that irrigation. So this involves maintenance and operation of the irrigation system. It involves decisions to not apply too much irrigation water early in the season such that it would saturate the soils and, and have an effect on the initial stand establishment of the young crop. But on the same token, it involves avoiding getting behind the curve on soil moisture and not being able to catch up. And so the importance of using irrigation scheduling programs or strategies is important here. And then as in terms of achieving maximum yield and, and, and managing the irrigation efficiently, if we can maintain adequate soil moisture in the field all the way to kernel black layer, that will help achieve maximum grain filling and maximum kernel weight and get us to maximum yield. We can improve crop resilience with hybrid selection. I mentioned this earlier. So when we choose hybrids, it's partly about identifying hybrids that have good yield potential. But maybe just as importantly, it's about identifying hybrids that have tolerance to a wide range of growing conditions. Because this stress tolerance is a, plays a huge role on determining the resilience of that crop to a range of stresses that you and I cannot predict. So. This picture shows an example of a field several years ago up in north central Indiana. You can see the different strips going through the field and they're, what they represent are two hybrids. Uh, hybrid A was a hybrid that uh, obviously, as it turned out, had much better resilience to stress. Now what happened in this field was after planting, it was planted a fairly normal late April, early May time period. But then it was followed by several weeks of cold, wet, crusty, and just simply crappy conditions for germination, emergence, and initial stand establishment. And so hybrid A got through that uh, stressful several weeks much better than hybrid B. And in fact, as it turned out, uh, yes, the farmer did replant. That's often a question that comes up when I show this slide. Uh, but the replanting was done almost exclusively in the strips of hybrid B because it had much poorer germination, much less successful emergence, um, and, and the stands were just horrible in that one hybrid. And needless to say, if the farmer had known that there were such differences between these hybrids for this early season kind of stress tolerance, uh, he may have made a different decision on, on using hybrid B in the first place. So again, Hybrid stress tolerance plays a big role in determining crop resilience, and that is, you know, again, partly on what the companies are making available to us, but it's also on us to make good decisions on choosing these hybrids. So the best way to assess hybrid stress tolerance is to see how well hybrids perform over a lot of yield trials. And I always tell farmers to get their hands on as many variety trial test results as they can and then look for those hybrids that always seem to be near the top in yield. And the reason I emphasize the need to get as many variety trials as we can get our hands on is, is that when we do that, that tends to represent a range of possible growing conditions that we might experience in years to come on our own farms. Some of the characteristics of hybrids that have an influence on their ability to tolerate stress include early season vigor, tolerance to heat or drought stress, uh, disease resistance, and root and stalk strength. We can improve crop resilience in no-till and strip-till systems by doing a better job of managing the surface trash, especially prior or during the planting operation. If we can manage that surface trash well, that will improve the drying and warming of the soil uh, after planting, which will encourage more uniform germination and emergence. It will facilitate the operation of the planter itself so that seed to soil contact, furrow closing is optimum. And with all of that, it simply improves the uniform, not just the uniformity of crop emergence, but also the vigor of those young plants as they're going through the stand establishment period. 
And so managing surface trash includes timely termination of whatever green growing cover there is out there, whether it's winter annual weeds or a winter cover crop. Using row cleaners ahead of the disc openers to make sure that the planter itself can do what it's supposed to do with opening slots and dropping the seed, covering the seed, closing the furrow. And then to the extent that you can avoid planting on the wet side, that will help uh, reduce the risk or avoid the risk of smearing those furrow sidewalls, uh, which can cause a, a lot of problems during emergence uh, as those young plants try to get through those, those uh, compacted sidewalls. We can improve crop resilience by simply minimizing the risks of creating soil compaction due to tillage or equipment traffic. And the deal with, crop, with soil compaction is that compaction makes poor drainage even poorer. It makes saturated soils remain saturated even longer. We know that soils are most vulnerable to creating soil compaction when soil moisture is near field capacity. And, and that fact in itself is a little bit aggravating because when, a, when soil moisture is near field capacity, that's about the day when we say it's almost ready to go. Compaction obviously limits the rooting depth of these young plants and in many cases the overall rooting mass. And so subsequently it lowers the resilience of that crop, especially to drought stress later on in the season if those roots are being restricted to a very shallow part of the soil profile. And so we can take steps to reduce the risk of soil compaction by avoiding tillage or field traffic when the soils are on the wet side or simply not fit to be on by using fewer tillage trips across the field or going all the way to strip till and no-till and eliminating most of the trips across the field. And then to the extent that we can minimize traffic from heavy equipment, for example, grain carts, and avoid creating the tire traffic compaction, especially in no-till where you really can't manage it with any tillage, uh, that's going to help reduce the risk of soil compaction. Another way to improve crop resilience is to simply avoid growing corn after corn, especially in no-till or reduced-till situations. A lot of corn stover on the surface and the old root balls, uh, will they can delay the drying of that surface soil and the initial warming, which will have an impact on the growth of the young plants. It can interfere with the, of the planter operation itself. The cold soils, the wet soils can slow germination, slow emergence, and slow the initial development of the young plants. As that uh, surface stover begins to decompose, uh, it uses soil nitrogen as part of that process and temporarily makes it unavailable to young plants, and that can create some severe nitrogen deficiency. We know that surface residue of corn harbors a lot of the important disease inoculum that we, that we deal with in corn. And then finally, heavy residue at the surface can intercept surface-applied herbicides and minimize the effectiveness of the weed control program. Now, you might consider using 2 by 2 row starter fertilizer to improve crop resilience to early stress. Um, the work that Jim Camerato and I have done would suggest that uh, 2 by 2 row starter should be uh, First of all, it focuses on nitrogen and, and should be no less than 30 pounds of actual nitrogen per acre and maybe higher in continuous no-till corn. This 2 by 2 starter aids the initial or the early transition of the young plants from reliance on the kernel reserves and the seed roots to increasing reliance on the primary root system or we call it the nodal root system. And this transition occurs around V3 and ends about V6. If conditions are not conducive to rapid, vigorous growth at that point in time, that transition can really struggle. And it's under those conditions where we think a 2x2 two two row starter fertilizer band simply aids the transition by the presence of that concentrated band of nutrients. And so it aids that transition and hopefully uh, will end up with more uniform stand establishment and give us that vigorous, uniform, healthy stand of corn at V6 that's so important for determining crop resilience. The other interesting thing about 2x2 two two row starter response in corn is that it tends to speed up overall development of the plants. They, they go through the growth stages a little faster. They reach soaking sooner. They reach kernel black layer sooner at the end of the season. 
And because they mature a little earlier, they have a little more time to dry down, and so they tend to end up at harvest one or two points drier. So that's an added benefit to the use of two by two starter fertilizer. If we improve our nitrogen fertilizer management, that can also improve crop resilience. And that's basically comes down to minimizing the risk of losing nitrogen in the first place and, and helping the crop get to a healthy uniform uh, point in time where it can simply make better use of the nitrogen. So uh, to the extent that you can avoid fall nitrogen applications, that will minimize the risk of losing nitrogen from the time it's put on in the fall to the time the crop uses it the next summer. If you avoid surface applied urea based products that will minimize or almost negate the risk of volatilization of that surface applied material. Side dress nitrogen is still the best timing, the most efficient timing of nitrogen application and so certainly use that where it's practical. And then sort of to uh, tally on to what we talked about in terms of the, the benefits of improving soil drainage again. Improved soil drainage reduces the risk of ponding and saturation, which reduces the risk of the denitrification that can lose soil nitrate nitrogen. We can improve crop resilience by reducing the potential for disease throughout the season, but especially from our foliar diseases. So a good disease control program begins with choosing the hybrids and choosing hybrids that have good genetic disease resistance. A good disease control program involves crop rotation and avoiding continuous corn, which I've already indicated has other problems, uh, but one of the benefits of crop rotation is to minimize the risk of some of these foliar diseases. Where tillage is appropriate, uh, that is an effective tool for minimizing disease in the following corn crop by virtue of burying all of the disease harboring uh, soil re uh, surface residue from the previous crop. And then the last leg or the final uh, point of defense on, on a disease program is the use of foliar fungicides where they're appropriate. So again, let's improve the, the potential for managing disease and that will keep that crop healthy and vigorous for the rest, for the remainder of that growing season. And I certainly can't, uh, I can't end this without at least mentioning the importance of weed control and minimizing the competition with weeds in order to improve crop resilience or maintain crop resilience. And, and I'll leave it to other weed experts for, to give you better information than I can, but a good weed management program certainly involves knowing what weeds you have in the fields, which weed species are you dealing with, and especially whether or not there are resistant populations developed that are be simply becoming harder to control with herbicides. Ohio and Illinois and Purdue uh, put out this weed control guide every year. It's available online. Uh, be sure to download a copy for your use and, and consider it to be the Bible uh, for developing good weed control programs. Consult the experts. I am not an expert, so I'm not gonna I'm not able to tell you to what to do specifically, but certainly control uh, consult the weed experts at the various land grant universities in the region. And then the last thing I'd say is kill them when they're small. Now, I, I realize now that you could construe that as killing the experts while they're small. And I, I don't mean to, uh, that's not what I meant. I'm talking about killing the weeds when they're small. And that's certainly a, an important part of a good weed management strategy. So finally, I'll just leave you with these um, summaries or these final comments. Normal weather anymore can that be just downright nasty. It is certainly more variable than it was years ago, and we certainly seem to get a higher frequency of extreme weather events. Weather stress on crops is compounded or amplified by other yield limiting factors in the fields. And so to the extent that we can identify and manage these other yield limiting factors, that will help improve crop resilience and help that crop better tolerate these unpredictable extremes of weather that we experience every year. And so with that, thank you for watching. If you have any questions after watching this, you can send me an email at my address that you see on the screen. And with that, I'll just simply say, have a good day.